My name's Scott Park, Park Farming. I started farming uh, in 1974. This is my starting the 48th year. Uh, I'm first generation farmer and the, our farm has evolved over time from uh, extreme chemical dependence on all practices until over 1985 I started realizing that uh, there's no future on the quality of the soil. I was seeing changes, but it, I didn't understand what was going on, but I knew what I was doing wasn't right. Uh, started messing with putting some wheat straw in the ground in 1986. In 1989, I experimented and planted my first cover crop. Um, not really, I, in fact, I'm not even sure if I have even heard the term cover crop before then. But anyway, we planted uh, somewhat of what we're planting right now. It was just a vetch crop. And, and actually 1990, that where we planted the cover crop turned out to be uh, the best. In the field, there was a block we didn't plant because we couldn't get at it. Um, and, and anyway, we, we, the, the cover crop turned out to be the best quality, the best tomatoes that we had in the field. And so I was a tomato grower pretty heavily and, and in time, then I started transitioning in ground. It was a very long process um, because I was first generation. Basically, I didn't have any money, but but over time, I've reached a point now where where we've had uh, I've transitioned in 34 fields um, over the last 30 plus years, and and then what all the rest of the farm transitioned as you go into organic and farming. With soil quality, monoculture doesn't work. Uh, for the most part, you need uh, three key components, uh, and one of them is crop rotation. It's just like in this field here behind me as we're planting a cover crop. So last year, it was rice. The year before that, it was corn. The year before that, it was beans. Um, the year before that, it was wheat. And the year before that, it was tomatoes. And it's going back into tomatoes this year. but. Uh, we have 1,500 acres that, that we're getting ready for next season, and of the 1,500 acres, we're planting cover crop on 1,400 of them. We do targeted tillage. Um, so we know the ground firms up, but there's no reason to excessively pound it with rippers and chisels. So we, uh, we know all our ground is is, is a uh, controlled traffic. The furrows behind me are the same furrows that were here 12 years ago within one inch. So we try to have all our traffic run only in the furrows and then therefore most of the ground does not have weight of tractors pressing on it. So we do run a ripper and we run the ripper as deep as 22, 24 inches. Um, but it also doesn't bring up any clods because the ground is in nice shape. The ground works up pretty nicely because of it and we're not doing excessive tillage on top of the bed. In fact, even on this ground with the rice, we're only tilling here about five inches. This, your, for your question on this equipment and availability, particularly the drill, is Great Plains drill. Um, the equipment's out of the Midwest, but it works fine here. Uh, we've drilled for, in fact, that, that drill uh, is close to 20 years old and, and it still runs fine. We have to replace bearings and discs and what have you, but actually Great Plains is, is good quality stuff and Great Plains designs the coulters in front to match the back of the drill 
So the cultures are cutting exactly in the line that, that the seed's gonna be going, and, and so trash is cut, and, and the, the double discs on the Great Plains drill can slip through without pushing and piling up with, with a bunch of residue. So as far as your question on the corn, the, the ops are the same. Basically what we do, here's what we'll do on the corn is we will go, we harvest the crop, we chop it. After we chop it, in our world, because it's organic, the, the first thing we do is we spread compost on it. And the reason for that is that, that one, when we want to incorporate the compost, because we don't want to lose it to the air. And the second thing is, is we want to put the compost with the corn stover to help the breakdown through the winter. And then we will till it one time. We run what's called a joker. Uh, it's out of uh, Germany or Austria. It's a horse product that you can run really fast. Like you can run seven miles an hour with it. And, and it does a really good job of then of mixing and cutting the, the, the corn stover. And, and we work it, you can set the depth. And we work it so it works in about three, maybe four inches, but still, hopefully you'll get a picture of it while you're up here. The fields are still basically covered with corn. And, and that's targeted tillage. That's all the tillage that we need to do and then we'll come in and if the field's going into tomatoes, we will make a pass with what's called a ripper stripper in, in the fall, right in the, we plant single row, uh, 15 inch spacing of the plants, but single row on a 60 inch bed. And just to be on the safe side, we will make a pass with a ripper and coulters on it in, where, right where the transplants go. And then we, we re-pull the beds and it's all rolling. Everything's rolling. The joker's rolling. The ripper stripper's rolling with coulters. The grain drill's rolling. You don't want to do anything that's pushing. Everything has to be have a give, have a roll to it. And, and so then we, we pull the beds up and, and that's just like this. And then we go ahead and, and we plant the cover crop. The cover crop goes all winter. We, we plant, um, we support firmly believe for spring, for planting, for early spring planting of your cash crop to not have a bunch of grasses. And then this is our opinion, just what we've experienced, but I've been doing it for 30 some years, that planting legumes, like here's ideal setting, it's okay. The legumes are probably thigh high end of February, first week of March. We go in and we chop it, mix it in about three inches, roll it down, let the moistures even out, let it sit for about three weeks. The end of March, we start planting our transplants. We can actually go in doing this, this is what I've described. We can go 30 to 40 days after we plant, put the transplants in the ground before we ever have to irrigate. From growing cover crops and, and putting all the residue in year after year, we have eliminated so many irrigations, so much use of water, and, and, and also on our end, coming from the organic, if you're not irrigating, you're not sprouting weeds. And we don't have any weed killers. So the best thing to do is to have that ground dry in that top two or three inches. It saves us the first hoeing. So the cover crops are doing a super value. And the other value that they're doing is that if we get hard rains in the winter, no water leaves the field. The field's a sponge. And we take advantage of that, by, which helps us eliminate the 30 to 40 days. Also, the ground is super mellow, so you don't have to make passes trying to create a seed bed. You can make a good seed bed in one pass with a combination of, of legumes and, and, and then just don't, don't work the ground excessively. But, but for the most part on our farm, if we create a clod any time of the year, we're doing something wrong. Clods should no longer be in your vernacular if you're doing proper care of the soil, putting residue in, growing cover crops. So oh, through time, we just learned to try and solve problems before they happen, which means you have to know there's a value of experience. And, and that's why, like one of the reasons I just hit on of the grasses. Grasses do a couple things. It's wonderful. There, it's, you know, everyone should have forbs, grasses and legumes if you can. 
but you should not jeopardize the flow of your farm in order that some people are saying, oh, you gotta plant multi-species. If you wanna plant multi-species, try and find windows, like we try and find windows in the summer on some of our crops. Then we'll plant more, just cover crops to, to make sort of make up for that only doing a nitrogen-based legume program. So things to watch for, I would, is like I hit on, is legumes. Time, be sure to have time between incorporation and planting. And there's, there's all kinds of microbial activity and it gets tied up at first when you're putting the biomass in the ground. Don't go till the ground one day, putting your cover crop in and planting the next. That's a kiss of death. You, you wanna have two or three weeks and as long as you give that time to break down. Also, when you put all that, the, the biomass in the ground, it seems to be, you don't see if you have a burst of insect activity feeding on it. And, and if a plant's dropped in the ground or a seed's dropped in the ground right after that, they're indiscriminate on what they're chewing on and messing up. So just be patient, give that self two to three weeks, be geared up, till as lightly as you can. There's no reason to overdo it. I would discourage coming in and plowing and flipping, but, but get a mix and then roll it down because if you don't have moisture, you're, you're gonna have problems. That the breaking down of the, of the biomass isn't gonna happen as fast as it should, and then you're gonna have problems. So you might even, maybe you have a dry pattern, like to, for us, 2020 was a dry pattern. But so we started putting cover crop under, instead of like going to the early March, in the middle of February, we started putting some under because the forecasts were relatively dry pattern in the future. We wanted to get this stuff broken down and just right for when we go to plant the end of March. So instead of waiting and doing what we normally do, we, you read the weather and you adjust and you match your farming practices to the weather, but you don't leave yourself exposed to having, putting the cover crop in and planting. Well, we usually start planting around the 20th of March and we plant, like we, we, we grow about 600 acres of tomatoes. We, we of the over, uh, it depends on the year, the price, 500 to 600. Uh, but most part it's, it's concentrated. Once we start planting, we go right through and, and basically then we're done. We start harvesting end of July or first week of August and we're done harvesting first week of September. Um, our corn is planted also in that same time frame. So usually we're growing two or 300 acres of corn. Uh, I didn't comment, but normally we're growing up to about 10, 15, 20 different crops, depending on the market. But the drivers, the foundation of the farm is basically corn and tomatoes. It sounds like also Contra Costa, but, but it's not sweet corn. It's white corn. We grow, we grow it for make tacos, tortillas, actually, and crops really the important crops that are creating gin and vodka and octavit and whiskey uh, as we grow red corn white corn and blue corn um, but but either way it's it's not for silage or anything like that it's it's for human consumption so having a later planting on the sweet corn that's ideal that lets you get the cover crop to grow a little more you want to put it under before it really before it goes to seed you're losing some of the advantage of the legume and and, and you could actually even grow more i i just discourage multi-species but in my world that's a tight time frame if you have the time to work the ground some and pre-irrigate then having you know like to me a mix of of 40 pounds of a of a legume a specifically vetch maybe 10 pounds of an oats uh, the oats are really good for the ground, good for the rotation, but that's only if you can work it in in April, pre-irrigate and have it match your sweet corn planting. Our, our, our equipment's going 24 hours a day. So right now with this setup, we plant about 100 acres a day, 50 acres a shift. Um, sometimes we plant slower, the, the, that this tractor doesn't have tanks on it, but a lot of times we're planting that we will be adding microbes and seaweed and it'll be being put right with the seed. Um, this ground has gotten a lot of microbes and a lot of seaweed. 
so we're really not feeling like it's not inoculated and ready to go. We are using inoculant with the legume. The inoculants are really cheap. They're a good investment. They're easy. They give you really complicated ways to do it. The complicated ways are good. They might be a little be better than what we do, but basically as we're loading the planter, the, 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 the operator is just spreading the inoculant. He's got a bag and the one bag should cover all the, we're putting about 1,500 pounds in every time we fill up the planter and he spreads one bag as he's filling it up and, and we seem to get good nodulation from doing that. That's right into the hopper. Yes, yeah. so it's simple and it's cheap and it's fast. Well, and here, so the rice is, rice is really a, uh, a challenge, you know. I mean, it's extremely fibrous and tough. You know, its tensile strength is, is unbelievable. So on here, we, we normally don't disc. As I mentioned, we just run that one joker one time. Like in here on the rice, it's a different ball game. Yeah, we disc this a couple times because the rice straw is, you know, it's long, it's tangly, it's tough. So, so we do beat, we beat up the ground. This is the only crop we grow that, that we run a disc on anymore. And, and the other thing is we've eliminated, we basic eliminated all triplaning, all ripping, all chiseling, all ext extensive tillage. We've pretty much shrunk it to targeted tillage on, on all our other crops. Rice is the only one that were pretty aggressive. Just, just be, and also I should comment only because this is going into tomatoes next year. For example, a lot of times we'll follow rice and we'll just go from rice to say dry beans. And, and we won't, we'll take the rice crop off, we'll chop it and we won't do any tillage. We'll immediately just pull in, or not immediately, we'll pull in and plant just with this setup that you're seeing and, and that's it. No tillage until, the, until that crop's harvested next late May or June. Uh, so this setup, you can eliminate tillage 100% even on probably the most fibrous and difficult crop to work uh, is rice except for flax. Flax is worse than rice. But other than that, the, you, you don't need to till. This will go through pretty much anything and get your seed in like a half an inch or so. Uh, for the winter. Well, any crop we take off, we shred. And, and I highly recommend it uh, just because of, of having the biomass break down. Again, this is in a different ball game than the no-till world, okay? The no-till world would not be wanting you to shred. It would be wanting to leave as long a piece as, as you can. I have, I have messed with no-till since 1997. Personally, I, I have a hard time saying no-till works on large-scale California farming on a diversified farm. And, and, but I could go for a long time on that. But for the mace, most part, we want to run a shredder chopper. We, we use a pack flail. It's, it, I mean, probably people know, but it's still it's an interesting fact that, that all residue breaks down from the ends. So the longer piece you have, the slower the breakdown. So the finer you can chop it, the faster you, you're breaking it down. We are not thinking of the biomass serving the purpose of covering the bed. Okay, it's good if it does, but the most important thing is, is we're using it as a continual food source for the soil. So our food source is chopped biomass that's lightly incorporated, compost, which is put in when the biomass is put in. And, and the cover crops that are being added. So in, in all our overall, our average, we're putting about 10 to 15 tons of biomass in the ground every year on every acre. We, we're big believers in letting mother nature pick up as many of our costs as possible. So like we're planting now, needless to say, with the dust, you can see we're planting dry. And, and, and so we don't go in and, and, and irrigate. And maybe, you know, actually I was gonna say we, we pre-irrigate some, but for maybe for wheat, for cover crops, we, will, we won't even, uh, we never pre-irrigate. We, what we do is watch the weather so that we, by the time at some point, 
this, the winter comes and stuff's wet. So we want to have all our cover crop in the ground. But other than that, it's just judging how long it's going to take. Like of our, you know, we got 1,400 acres here and, you know, with Sundays off and what have you. It, it takes us 16, 18 days to get across it. So we started planning, a, you know, a few days ago. Our, usually our farm kind of slows down after Thanksgiving. And so we're just gonna kind of fit in there and, and the weather looks like relatively November, we're gonna get a little rain, but it's not gonna be much. So, so we're on top of it, just don't expose yourself. And, and there's no loss. We've had years where we've gone till the 1st of January before we've ever gotten the rains on the cover crop. They've still done fine. The cover crop is gonna sit and grow some but it really won't start taking off and growing like crazy into February. In the middle of February till the 1st of March, it'll do 60% of its growing. In the first week of March, it'll be another 20%. That's a huge amount that happens then. So if you can, you wanna hold off that long. But, but that's about it. You know, have it fit your operation. It's not complicated. We, for the most part, save our seed. So you, so you have your, you grow your own cover crop seed. Yeah. Wow. Um, how long have you been doing that? Oh shoot, I don't know, twenty years. 20 years. Uh, is that a very advanced step? You think? No. Said so you can do it your first year. Well, all you need is you need a crop that 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 you don't plant till later June you know, in order to give the cover crop a chance to grow out. So sometimes like for us on rice, rice, rice kills basically all the microbes because it's anaerobic and your next season, it's really hard to grow a high, not, and for example, it'd be really hard. It's really, I do not follow rice with corn. Okay, that, that just, that you're asking for trouble. Um, so you want to grow leguminous type crops following rice. So ideal for us on some of our rice fields is we'll harvest the rice, we'll chop it, we'll just go plant the cover crop. We got nothing into it except for the cost of our seed and it's our seed. So even that is not very expensive and you just leave it. And then in, in June or late May, whenever it's ready, you, you just run a combine in, you harvest it, save the seed and uh, that's, that covers you've harvested that for seeds, so you've actually got your cash crop for the next year. If you want to push it, you can take the cover crop off and then go pre-irrigate and plant beans or millet or something and, and get a summer cover crop out of it. If you look at the way we look at it, it's every aspect of, of cover crops, but they're part of the bigger picture of crop rotation, you know, of, of conservation tillage, of controlled traffic, but the overall cover crops, I'm going to use that, but it, 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 all the ops kind of fit for it. What I'm trying to get at is if you grow a cover crop and then you go in and you work the ground wet, putting the cover crop in and you plow it, you just destroyed everything you're trying to accomplish. Like, like it all kind of has to fit together. You have to respect each phase of your operation. But if you do it, I find every, every part of our farm in whatever you're talking about, be it tillage, water consumption, water retention, soil structure, um, nitrogen availability, quality, huge impact on quality. That, that we keep contracts, for example, in tomatoes, it's not as big of a deal now as there's more acres lost to trees, but you know, it was a dogfight to keep a contract for tomatoes. Through the years, we kept the contract, even though we're on the northern edge of canneries, because of our quality. The throughput, the, the, the case yield that the cannery could get from ours without us making any special effort. All we're putting on our ground is compost, microbes, and seaweed. That's it. There is nothing else on all the different crops that we're growing. And what's doing it? What's doing it is just that constant feeding, the digestion, the cycling in the system, the microbes that have access to the zincs and the manganese and the molybdenum, whatever is needed. And I'm not in trying to manipulate that picture. I'm throwing sort of the kitchen sink at the soil, giving it time to break down and make it available in all, all aspects. So the, the, it works, the system works 
and, and you benefit. I mean, examples like crust. Crust is out of our vernacular. It just doesn't happen anymore. The other one's tillage of deep, of the ground firming up. Like I mentioned, that will go rip 24, 22 inches in the furrow and have no clods. Basically, even that where the tractor and the compaction is happening, it still it, it amounts to, to next to nothing as far as destroying soil structure. So you think of every aspect of your operation and, and building up the soil with cover crops as one of your avenues, you're going to get that money back time and again. And, and in a drought and the talk of it drying out the ground, there, there's circumstances where it happens, but there's, there's oddball stuff in every aspect of what you do in farming. And, and I would, in our world, I'd say it's the exact opposite. That, that, it, that what it's doing is it making the ground such an effective sponge, not a drop leaves your field. I mean, we've had, like last year in 2019, we got 36 inches of rain. We never had a drop leave any of our fields. Well, I, I would say that it'd be air on the safe side, if you're going into arenas that you're not used to, I really highly recommend just playing it safe on, on a legume. A legume incorporates and works in really easy. I've had horrendous problems from using grasses in winter cover crops. And again, that's just me. Everyone has their own world, whatever you're doing. But for my sake, from what I've seen, it's just, it's best if you're, if you're going into the winter and you're gonna be planting a spring cash crop, Stay, stay with legumes until you're starting to think you're really good. I have lost a lot of money. I've screwed up big time. I've gotten killed from having cover crops and then having it jammed in on top of a cash crop and the soil not ready, the microbes tied up, the carbon nitrogen, the CN ratios are a mess and, and, and it can be a, a horrendous disaster. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a learning curve. So just give yourself ample time space wise you know, calendar-wise, that, that if you put something in, you, you're, you're, you can get it worked in properly, have moisture, and that it's breaking down and it's no headaches. And so that's, that's yeah, there's no, I, I've had, my problems have come from when I've wanted to get a whole bunch of grasses growing. Grasses are great, there's no argument, they're super for the soil, but you have to grow for a profit. And, and that's, and it's important as I give, as I talk and I'm asked these questions, it's in the first time, we are profit driven. We want to make money. But the, the idea is so many people see cover crops that, oh, this is just, you're an environmental freak, yada, yada. They're making me money. They're making me money in every phase of our operation. I wouldn't be doing it to lose money. The cover crops help every aspect of looking at, you know, there's four ways to make a profit, and one of them is lowering your costs. Cover crops lower my costs. Cover crops simplify the farm. Thank you very much, Scott Park. It's still slow. The grasses seem to be doing better. Um, but yeah, we've got nettle, we've got chickweed, we've got mustard. And that's okay. That's fine, because we're, we're going to work it in anyway. It gives us, there's more, you know, the ideal is legumes, forbs, and grasses. And we actually have legumes, forbs, and grasses growing now. So if you, you know, to have the ideal cover crop mix, that's what you want. So this is also veg, but it's also everything else. This actually last year, was a field of it was a cover crop was a vetch cover crop for seed uh, and then it sat during the summer but so when it sat through all last spring it got a horrendous weed population of other stuff you know we've got shepherd's purse we've got yeah. chickweed we've got mustard we've got a little bluegrass we've got vetch so there's two ways to see it. You can see it is that it's horrible, it's a mess, or you can see it is it's fine because it's a we got a multi-species cover crop. So the furrows it stays a little darker, a little moister every morning, and that makes a difference on that they grow more. So <clears throat> all the furrows in every field <clears throat> have the most growth. And then if it goes to a wet pattern, it goes the exact opposite. 
it's too wet in the furrows. They plants tend to die uh, right. in the top of the beds or where your healthy plants are. You see this doesn't have, there's not much moisture. But it still has a really, oh. it still has a nice tilth, like that's almost all organic matter. That feels really moist to me, so that's, but that's... That feels moist to you? Yeah, but no. this time of year, this is... This is, that's bone dry relative to what it should be. Yeah, that's really dry. When termination starts um, is sometimes it depends on what the crop is how soon we're, we're in we were holding off we've actually got a lot of acres we got about a thousand acres we've got to do here in the next week uh, to get to start pre-irrigating this this has been we've only gotten five inches of rain uh, since a new rainfall year started and uh, most of it was we got two and a half inches over a day and a half and the rest has been very little like we've gotten like in the last month almost zero so yeah we're now we're in getting it knocked down because we got to start planning uh, in the next couple weeks in this specific field this is a drip field this is a field coming out of tomatoes going into corn which I understand from your area is appropriate and uh, so uh, we planted a vetch crop in here which has produced really poorly uh, in fact all our vetch has produced poorly this season and we're not sure we kind of feel like we're copying out blaming seed but but we also have other legumes planted side by side with the vetch and the other legumes are doing really well. So, so we're kind of thinking um, we might not have really gotten some very good vetch. Plus it hasn't been a good environment period for legumes this year. It seems like brassicas and, and, and other and weeds, uh, chickweed, shepherd's purse, stinging nettle, depending on high nitrogen are all doing fine uh vetch has been the dog so anyway we're we're just do as few passes as we can as shallow as we can and so in here we'll go we're running what's called a joker sort of a vertical disc to chop up the residue cut break it loose and then we're running a lilliston to mix it more and break it up more uh, we don't have it running in the field today but we're going to follow behind with a a flat roller and the roller will level off the bed and kind of press it down to get good capillary action between the uh, the clods and the dirt and then we're going to turn on the drip and uh, and give the field a really good soak and hopefully turn around and be planting this in about two and a half weeks um, that's that's the goal and the, after we run the the drip and wet everything so that the residue is broken down by the time we go to plant. Um, we'll, uh, we'll scratch it after we run and wet the ground in order to get the wave of weeds that are going to come from the wetting. Hopefully those are going to catch the spring weeds. We'll till the ground, plant the corn, keep the top couple inches dry and shoot for no weed pressure during the season. So 
So from front to back, we're running extensions out in the furrow. These fields only have the tractor run in the furrow. Um, so we, the ground's so dry, the flotation is not an issue, but we have them on anyway. So this is a joker disc. And the advantage of this is it, it doesn't really flip the soil as much. It does a really good chopping. These bands in the back here are for depth control. So we can work approximately from one inch to five inches. Uh, right now we're running about three or so. And the back shovels we had custom made that they are really, so this back part we added, this is the normal part that you'd buy. This we put on so when we make a pass, we can control and, and we don't have to come in and, and shape the beds again. Well, we do, but this is the start of it. And it's a good job of going in and cleaning out all the residue that's in the furrow. So this is designed and it runs really fast. We can go six miles an hour or faster. Six is fast enough for us. So we cover a lot of ground with really relatively minimal disturbance other than breaking and chopping up the residue. Uh, so that's what this is for. best to look from behind the uh... so we just this is the joker is roughly shaped a bed this is running to pull the weeds out get a second shot at them they're really tangly as you'll notice everything is moving parts on that sled and everything's moving parts on this sled except for these back shovels have been cleaned out enough but even then they can be a problem. So anytime dealing with all this biomass, things have to be moving, okay? Stationary sucks, it plugs, jams up. So anyway, this one's running. Again, it's economical. He's going about five, six miles an hour. Easy load on the tractor. Both tractors are probably using three, maybe four gallons an hour at max. So we get a lot of done every day with uh, low fuel usage low impact on the ground we are working it we do want to mix in the biomass we don't want to just leave it we don't want to plan into it because we we have other problems and we want to make a seed bed by doing it so anyway this will run then following this we'll run a roller and it'll square and flatten off the top of the bed and then we'll pre-irrigate So someone looking at this would be concerned about the amount of biomass that they still see. And if this was like uh, grass, a cereal type, it, it, it would be a headache. But the fact is that, that most of it is a brassica, is a broadleaf type uh, or a legume. It's going to, with a pre-irrigation, it's going to break down and it's not going to be any issues. I, I, I do place value on getting this done a couple weeks before you plant. I don't want... Like when you turn in all this nice green stuff, you get a lot of insect activity. So, so it's better to turn it in, irrigate it, get, or if we are, we're getting rains or there's a lot of moisture, you don't have to worry about irrigating. Most years, nine out of 10, we don't have to pre-irrigate. The, the cover crop does not come close to drying out the ground. This year with how much little rain we've gotten, yeah, moisture is a big deal. But normally you take this much biomass, put it in the ground, or even we usually have almost twice as much biomass on a normal year of rain. This is the same ops that we'll do. We might run a chopper first and then run these, but it didn't grow enough to cause a chopper. 
but then you mix that in with the soil, it breaks down, the moisture pulls up after you roll it. In two, three weeks, there's no more residue visible. You go and plant, you still have great moisture, and your ground's in beautiful shape. So knowing farmers, they'll probably be thinking, boy, these beds are unlevel. And they're right, they are. To try and finish an operation and go to the trouble to get everything squared away, um, it's just extra ops and we're doing more ops. So we're kind of just kind of chip away and get the beds level. When we actually run the flat roller, it's going to be pretty close to true because this ground is in really nice shape. As you see how easily the shovel goes in, the, the, even though it's, it is, it's dry, it's crumbly, it's full of roots. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's in nice shape. So, so the ground will work up nicely, although this is really the most extensive working we're due. After we pre-irrigate with a drip and come in, we're just gonna like, maybe we'll run that Lilliston. Uh, anyway, it'll be something light that'll just take out the weeds that are sprouting from the irrigation. And, and, and that's it, we'll, we'll just go in and plant the corn. What about the fertilizer? The fertilizer's already been put on this field. After the tomatoes, we go in and actually split away the beds to lay, because this is organic, to lay the compost in or chicken litter right next to the drip tape. Um, we actually cut almost within two inches of the tape and almost as deep as the tape, it's 12 inches. So we had gigantic piles as we moved it away. Then we have a compost spreader that has a splitter on it over each row. We do three rows at a time and we put piles of compost on each side in order to try, we do, we, to try and get maximum use out of the chicken litter. We do have problems with drip irrigation on our farm because the ground is too loose and we can't get it to move laterally very well. It's one of the reasons we're gonna come in and roll it is actually try and pack it so that we can get better capillary action and, and wetting. Um, our farm actually does ex much, much better furrow irrigated than drip, but uh, we do have this drip system in and, and we will make it work for the corn. Every field, everything, the drip tapes put in on sub one inch GPS and all the tractors are running on sub one inch. Everything's running where it should. Uh, we don't till very deep. Uh, it's in, the reason it's in the depth it's in is because when we plant the tomatoes, the, the, usually the tomatoes are about six inches tall and the plug, we have a big plug. So we might be going and we plant, we only have a little bit of the tomato, the top of it sticking out. We might have that plug going in eight, nine inches. So, so we don't want tape at 10 inches because there's too much risk of the drip tape getting hurt by the transplanter. Um, so that's, that's why we're in the depth we're in and, and we don't have any problems. What we do know is you notice turning, the, the one problem we do have is on the ends, the, the drains. We've got to pull up a little early because we don't want to step and break the drains. And, and so that's kind of a pain in the butt, but, but other than that, yeah, there's no problem with the drip. Well, more typical, the growth would, would easily be 50% and probably 100% more We'd have uh, most years, the field right now would be just a color of, of vetch. Maybe there'd be a little purple bloom, but there's almost no vetch. It's, it's pretty much chickweed, a uh, little stinging nettle, little uh, shepherd's purse. And, uh, but the, you know, the, the thing is the chickweed and the stinging nettle tell you the ground's fertile. Um, so, so it's okay. We just, we kind of wasted our money this year on the vetch, but uh, it really wasn't very, our, we go pretty low rate, like 30, 35 pounds. And, you know, the seed cost is in the 70 cents. So we got, you know, we got 20, 25 bucks an acre into it. So, you know, the fact that it bombed is not, is not the end of the world. And, and the operations this is doing, you, you, you would be doing this anyway. If you had zero brown ground that you had sprayed Roundup on, you would still probably be making two passes before whatever, enrolling it and either planting or, or so there's no, 
there's no real extra ops going on because we planted a cover crop or any really extra ops because we just have a nice crops of weeds um, we're still the 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 soil has the soil is not st stuck up it doesn't go oh i don't enjoy a weed i only want a legume the whole interaction with the live plants and the roots is still going on so you know the benefits are still there they're just not as great as in years past with normal weather patterns Okay, so the growth is pretty much done for these weeds. Uh, the nettle will probably grow a little more, but you can actually tell this is the way the whole, if you take a shot up the furrow, you see how it's yellow and the top of the bed is green. And, and some of that's because, the, because of the weather pattern, only the furrows had moisture during the winter as it was getting shaded by the sun. So the furrows are kind of done. They're shutting. They've already done their growth bit. And the top of the beds still have some green going, but their growth is it's pretty much, it's pretty much over. Um, so we'll, uh, we do have the chicken litter is on the bed, but it's stripped. And it's probably helping a little bit of that top being green. But mostly it's just that the top of the beds stayed bone dry till uh, close to the end of December. Um, so that's just having, having when did you apply the chicken litter uh, last fall yeah we're just pulling the pulling the uh, residue out we want to we want to shut it down we want to basically have it broken down by the time we plant in two two and a half weeks so that's why that jokers pulling it out and the Lilston's pulling it out again trying to maintain something resembling a bed um, but that's uh, and to do it economically and not make any more passes than necessary, um, just for to try and make a buck. Yeah, don't complicate it. Uh, pull it out, irrigate it, lightly cultivate it, and plant the corn. Uh, in this field, there's pretty much almost no tractors have run anywhere but in the furrows for the last ten years. Um, yeah. um, they have good drivers that take it. <laughs> no, actually, it isn't good drivers. They're, my drivers are great, but I don't, I'm not intending to knock them. There's nothing easier than GPS. You get to the end, you turn, oh, it lines up on green, you drop the sled so you don't wipe out the drain, plastic drains on the end of the drip tape. And, and you can go to sleep at the end of the row. A beeper comes on about 100 feet from the end of the row to wake you up. You get to the end, you lift up, you turn, you line up on the green light, you take off again. It's, it, it's actually, this has eliminated the art of cultivating. You know, in the old days before GPS, drivers were unbelievably good at driving very close cultivating on tomatoes. I mean, this is my 48th year now with tomatoes. And for about the last 40 of them, 
it, it took an excellent tractor driver to cultivate. Uh, and now, you know, the drivers are, it's, it takes skill, but it's, it was harder in the old days by far. So like this has been, he, he's run on, yeah, these beds, the, the Lilson's gone. And the, the other thing we're doing too is, we, we, it's not very noticeable because of all the, the, the growth on the beds, but we're actually knocking the beds lower. We, we, we like to go into the winter with the dead, beds pretty deep. Uh, for drainage is, is the main thing. Uh, but now, and this is going to be drip, and, and it'll be easier to wet the bed if the bed is lower than if the bed's sitting way up above. Then we put the drip in 12 inches. So when we roll it, it's going to even be knocked down more. The first pass, the, the furrows were probably eight inches deep. Now they're down to about four or five. After we roll it, they're going to be down to about three. And, and because this is a drip field, we'll keep it like that for the rest of the season. On other fields that were furrow irrigating, we would keep the beds uh, um, deeper, the, the furrows deeper than what, what we're doing here. Remember I showed you this field. It, it, this has had a lot of the bluegrass, it still does, but now it's, it's, it's getting covered, some of it's by vetch. But the break, here's the break of the peas, okay? And the peas, these are only three rows compared to 10 rows here per bed. These have three rows, but you can see how, how the peas have done a pretty good job of competing with weeds. Whereas the vetch in this row, there's vetch, but it's, it's, it's pretty poor. Everything else is getting overrun. The peas are going to get overrun here over the next week's time as it warms up. But they've basically done their bit. So that's, we put peas in a few fields just to see how they would perform. We had some left over from planting peas for seed. And so we just planted, planted some to just watch how they grow compared to the vetch. And, and like we're going, we're going to be getting this lousy vetch. Uh, we're better off to have peas. But it, really, the best planting is to put bell beans, Austrian peas, and any type of vetch. I'd stay away from hairy. Probably purple vetch is the best. Of and then each year, whatever the weather pattern fits, one of them's going to perform well. So you're always going to get something. Um, we've just found over time that it's not worth the cost. We've done fine with vetch year after year. This year's probably the first time it's bombed in actually ever. Um, wow. But we also think it's a seed because just to finish the story, we have two fields that that we did plant this year's vetch. We had vetch come up volunteer from last year, and that vetch is beautiful. So it, it, it helps us to draw the conclusion that the vetch seed might have been a dud. So this is the grass that we were seeing a month ago. Now the vetch is going through. Normally this would be pretty loaded with earthworms about this time of the year. But it, as you can see, it's, it's so dry. Um, there's still tons of fibrous stuff in the soil of root systems. And it has the rhizosheath that you look for so the hmm. life is there, it's just bone dry. Just bone dry. Yeah, if, uh, the final thoughts are for myself, uh, mind you, we have really good water rights and really good water quality. Um, and so I'm not concerned about the dry pattern. Uh, we'll still get most of our water, not all of it. Uh, but it's not an issue, so I'm not all excited about what I'm going to do. So it's an advantage. Sorry for people that don't have as good water rights, but you know, 
it comes and goes. We each have our strengths and weaknesses of where we're located farming. So to me, right now the year is an upper. My net is pretty proportional to how dry it is in the winter because we have a lot of problems that where rains go into April and this cover crop you're looking at, we've had more three times in since 2000, including 2006, three times we've had cover crops that have been seven feet tall coming into, we can't get on the ground into April and it just keeps growing and growing. March, it'll grow five times more than it grew the five months before. You know, and because we're organic and we can't spray and we can't get in and chop, uh, we, we've had some, some train wrecks. And so, but you balance that by, you know, normal years we do really well and dry years we do fine. So, so I'm not concerned about it as long as we can get in and pre-irrigate, get this straw, the residue broken down before we, uh, we plant uh, at, in an adequate time, couple weeks, 10 days, we should be fine. We should do really well.